How you doing, Rhonda? Living the dream, Paul. So am I. You dick! Fuck. Who, who sent her that? So this transmission came to me because he had a massive leak, couldn't figure out where it was coming from. There was oil everywhere. This is in actually one of these Cobra kit cars. He couldn't figure it out and it's a real bitch to pull out. So in the meantime, he also said, hey, these TKO transmissions shift like crap. So can you do anything about it to make it shift better? So I said, sure, I'll go through the unit, I'll change the case. So you get a little bit rebuilding video on how to take apart a TKO 500, 600 series transmission, as well as upgrade the shifting a little bit. So let's tackle this build, huh? These books you can find online, they're rare, but this is the original 3550 and TKO Transmission Service Manual, which was published by Tremec. It's a pretty good book, but it's all in black and white and illustrated, but it gets the job done if you need to use it. But you can also go on their website, which I believe is Tremec.com, and download the whole book, and there may be some updates, who knows. Please leave me some comments below on this video. Let me know what you think about it. So what we have here is a Tremac TKO 500-600 series transmission. And the customer is complaining of oil leaks. It's not really coming from the back. It's just that he did not empty the transmission as I asked him to. Then I looked over here and I saw it was kind of wet, but I figured maybe he drained some out. But on the closer inspection, there's actually a crack running right over here. Kind of runs up there. Just a little hairline crack. And you have to wonder, how did that ear crack actually? It's got gussets over here, it's pretty strong. So why did this thing crack? So when you're working on any of these transmissions, you wanna remove all the electrical connectors because you can break them if this heavy transmission rolls over. So these are, usually have a seven eighths inch type of uh, hex on them. These are seven eighths. Take that one off. On the back one, I actually just use an adjustable wrench back here. He's resealed with some Teflon tape on the threads. This is your neutral safety switch, and that was your reverse switch. So I like to put them aside so I don't mess them up again if it rolls over, like, like that, okay? First thing you're gonna do is, you can remove this part of the shift cover if you need to inspect it. This is the old style cover, but you don't really need to do that. There are gonna be six Bolts on this cover, same one on the newer style. 13 millimeter or a half inch socket will work on them. Now some of these bolts may have different lengths. So you wanna make sure that you neatly categorize all the bolts that you take off for this transmission because some of them are different. So I have a little box set up and I'm putting them all in line. Cover's gonna have to come off too. All right, so I've taken off these four bolts. They're the same size as, again as the shifter bolts, but still keep them separate. So we got this and this off. And you can take a pry bar and get in here and pry off these covers. There are no gaskets on this transmission, just sealant. This is the anaerobic gel that I use. That's what they use from the factory on these. So you can leave this offset lever and rail in place. You don't have to take this off because we're gonna disconnect these and then you can pull the whole thing out with this in place. So you really don't need to disassemble this rail and this shoe unless it's extremely necessary. This shifts are pretty much as this is how it works. It's like on a universal joint. It's a pretty easy type of shifter. It doesn't seem like it's worn. It doesn't seem like it's loose inside doesn't have any play. So this is a good shifter. But again, this is the older style uh, 3550 Tremec shifter, not the newest style TKO 500, 600 sh shifter. So you're gonna have different types of arms here. Fifth and reverse, third and fourth, first and second, okay? And you really should mark them because you can actually put these in upside down. So however you wanna do it, if you want to put like R here, you want to put 3, 4, 
something like that. One, two. Mark them. I use a 3 16 roll pin punch and punch these pins through. And when you punch these pins through, some of them will drop into the transmission because the fifth gear is right below this with a big gaping hole. So now that these are disconnected, I should be able to pull this whole extension housing off with all these rails in place. But I believe, you see how they work? Very simply come off like this, but they're not going to happen until the extension housing is removed, okay? We'll discuss those later as far as how they work. Right, before I can remove the extension housing, I have to take the speedometer fitting out. And one of the most ridiculous designs about these TKO or any of these Tremac transmissions is they love putting the speedometer fittings right near the mount so the cable comes right out and hits the mount. And you'd have to make a sharp bend because usually there's going to be a cross member here or something in the way. So, uh, again, that's why you have to understand that these transmissions were originally for the truck mount market. Because if they had half a brain, they wouldn't design a transmission where the cable comes right out near the mount. It's almost impossible to have a nice clean bend on a cable because of these transmissions. Especially when you use this adapter housing. What they've done here is they've used an adapter housing to go to a GM thread. Normally the cable goes right in there with a gear on it for the Ford application. But they have these adapters that go in place and then have the 7H typical GM thread on there. So it has to make you wonder, how can they design a transmission that well if they can't make the extension housing clearance properly for a speedometer cable? So somebody put this little Allen screw thing in here. Normally they come with a regular bolt. It's like a quarter 20 bolt. The speedometer driven gear adapter housing is simply a housing that converts the Ford style gear with the clip to a 7 inch thread style that's used on GM applications and a lot of common speedometers. Normally in a Ford application, this gear is actually in a similar fitting, but it's crimped right directly to the cable. So this housing here is an adapter again that converts from the Ford style to the GM style. It's quite common. The problem is when you put this adapter on it, it makes it very difficult to bend the cable because normally the cable starts here. Now it's going to start over here. And that extra inch where the mount is can create a lot of clearance issues. Next step, we're going to take off all these bolts on the extension housing. Lovely amount of sealant on the threads. And these transmissions are very heavy. They're not like the old Muncie's and T10s. It's probably over 100 pounds. It's, it's very hard to maneuver on a bench quite easily, like the other ones. So I've got all my bolts removed, and because this is just glued in place, I should be able to just tap it with a hammer on the side and break the sealant loose. Before you take this cover off, there are going to be O-rings in this area, this area, and this area. A lot of times they'll get cut off when you take it off. So be very careful that you try not to cock the cover, move it up and down in any way at all and try to pull it straight back because you, there are overings here and you could ruin them. The extension housing has a locating dowel on this side so you really can't move this ex extension housing around that much. But as you start prying it out, you can walk it back but as you are prying it out, you'll usually be able to remove some of these offset levers, okay? So I'm going to take this one out, I'm going to take this one out, and the other one out. And here are those O-rings I was talking about. Okay, what came out is the counter gear rear bearing race and shims. This goes in extension housing. Over here, I'm retrieving one of the dowels. So if you look at the three dowels I took out of the levers that go on the shift rails, you'll see that two are the same size and one is longer. And that corresponds to the three levers. And if you look at the levers, this is what gives you a shift tension. There are springs built into the levers. So when these three levers are laying in 
the transmission, each spring, spring here and spring there, force the, the shift rail to stay on the center lever. And as you move left and right, this one for reverse has an additional plunger. So as this lever moves that way, it's forced to push a spring upwards and create additional uh, movement. And that also has to move a certain way for reverse also to work. It actually gives you a lockout for reverse over here. So before I take the top cover off, what I thought I'd do is I'd take this other shifter cover off so you can see the forward mount location. See these control levers over here control the shift forks and there's a kit that you can buy that converts these levers, so I'll put another lever in over here and a rail so that you can use these with a top shift mount for like truck applications. Okay, because they use anaerobic sealant and probably did a sloppy job of putting this in, they got a lot of anaerobic sealant which is like Loctite in the threads of these bolts. So you may have to heat them up. We're going to be changing this case anyway, but the reality of it is, is if you're going to reuse the case, you may want to heat the bolts up to burn out the sealant because you can strip the threads in the case. So what I'm doing is I'm melting the thread locker anaerobic sealant, which again I believe that they probably overdid it and got it inside the threads of the case. This is just too brutal to get off. And anytime I look at the sloppy workmanship that goes into building these transmissions, again, this is why I don't like them. I don't sell them, I don't sell parts, I don't support them, but I will fix them for people. Because, oddly, a lot of the dealers that sell these transmissions don't do repairs. And I get it. See, and when something's really tight, I don't like using even the air impact because I'm afraid it's going to strip. So this is the locating dowel, and this is the locating dowel up here. So again, you want to pry the cover straight up. And there's little pry tabs over here. So see, we get in here. They put a pry tab over there, but don't really have anything to pry against, so it's coming off pretty easy. There you go. Have a nice looking transmission. Synchronize your rings, all the gears look good, the engagement teeth of the gears look good. It's just a question again of pulling everything apart. Maybe seeing how these rings fit on the gears, how they feel on them. I have a video on how synchronizer rings work. It may be a good idea to go check that out. But we'll see if these rings really lock up well when I take this whole piece apart. Now you can remove the four bolts from the input shaft bearing retainer. You can do this in the beginning if you want, but I like to keep the gear train held together until I have the cover off. There's really no place to pry on this case. They don't have a relief for prying. So when you pull the retainer off, you're gonna see a bearing raise inside of it, and there's shims behind that raise. You wanna make sure you don't lose them you want to keep it intact, keep it in place. This little spacer that came off was from the guy's hydraulic release bearing uh, that they made. It's poorly done, by the way. It's all cut at an angle and not really straight. Input shaft to pull straight out. Once you pull the input shaft straight out, there are needle bearings inside of it. 
you don't want to lose them. These needles are actually the same needles that I use for top loaders and the T5 transmissions. It's torn to number C417Q. There's 17 of these needles inside that input shaft. We're going to start working on the back end. And you have your rear counter gear bearing. And this is the fifth synchro and cone assembly. These will pull right off. And of course there's needles underneath it. There's another 3 16 dowel that holds the fifth reverse fork in place. Punch it out. Keep it with the fork. Now there's more needles that are going to come out that are under this gear. All right, there's two rows in them. There's a spacer here that obviously kind of comes down like this. This spacer goes in between both row, rows. So when you take it out, the needles are going to fall out, the spacer is going to drop down, and you just don't pile the needles against one another. Row of needles goes on the gear, spacer goes on, and another row of needles goes on the gear. I'm going to bag these needles up. These needles, by the way, look identical to the same needle bearings used in Super T10s and Muncie's four speeds. Uh, I believe these are of Torrington number C407Q is the number of these bearings. In case you run out of them, you may have some laying around your shop for another application, but that's why I'm very careful to bag everything like this that's loose. I'm going to bag them also with their shim so they're all together. Make sure there's no other needles anywhere else. And that's good. And I might as well throw that dowel in with these needles since I know it's going to be for that fork in the back end. Just bag it. Now while we're at it, this fifth speed assembly, the hub is actually part of the fifth gear. Okay? There's no need to take this off. We're just changing the case. But if you had to take it off, it's like any synchronizer assembly. It comes out, keys and springs will pop off, and that'll be it. If you want to take them off, also make a note of that the shallow edge of the hub, of the synchro hub, goes against the fifth gear. It actually fits into a recess of the gear. If you flip it around the wrong way, it's not going to work properly. If you need to mark the outside, mark the outside if you're going to take it apart. That's what's great about having these nice little paint marker pens. Just mark the outside with a little dot so you know that that's the outside. That's simple. Next step is to remove the fifth gear thrust washer. Now there's a little anti-rotation ball over there. Make sure you get a magnet and take it out. You don't want to lose that. I always like to remove speedometer gears, even though you can pull the main shaft out with the speedometer gear on it, because I don't want to damage the gear. It's plastic. So you got a retaining ring, and probably underneath there is going to be a, a bearing of some sort. Which so over here there's a another bearing. If you just move the main shaft a bit, the rear bearing race will come off. Now on the front over here is the fourth gear synchronizer assembly and the thrust bearing races and you don't want to lose that and it really should be put into the main shaft when you, you, you know, put it back together again. So you just kind of hold it like this in place and then pull the whole assembly up. It's a little heavy so be careful you don't drop it on your fingers, okay? But you can lift this up and then kind of pull this out, okay? Like this if you need to. Get this out of the way, take some of the load off. Now there's a thrust bearing assembly in here. The race and the thrust bearing for the input shaft. There's another race that's on the main shaft, okay? Right here, this one. So kind of sandwiches the bearing between the two races. Again, take note of the synchronizer assembly, how the thin edge is facing forward. And on the 1-2 assembly, the gear is facing forward. This will give you something to grab on, if anything. Then just pull the whole main shaft out. Normally you don't have to take out the reverse section and the counter gear 
and any of the bearings if you're going to just do a synchronizer ring change. Since this is a major case change, the cluster gear and the reverse assembly, reverse arm and the rail, everything has to come out. And if you notice here, you can see all the oil that the guy never drained it like I asked him to. This roll pin here is what holds the actual roller in place for the reverse linkage rail. Once the pin is punched through, you could rotate this rail like this and lift up the actual roller and slide the rail out. The next step is to remove the reverse gear and the reverse idler. And through the gear is the reverse shaft. It's right over here and runs through the gear. And once I pull the shaft out this way, there's a bunch of needle bearings inside this. And if you pull it out gently, you can actually pull this out with the needles in place. If you hold your fingers on it like this, and then hopefully put the shaft back through it so we won't have to pack the needles. Let me see if I can do that. Here goes nothing. I'm gonna push the shaft out. get in there with a punch. And there's a roll pin at the end of the shaft. I already heard them drop so it's gonna be impossible. <laughs> My fingers are just too fat so they already dropped. I could feel that they dropped. There they go, all the needles are out anyway. Once the eye gear is out, you could just pull this rear bearing out for the cluster, like this. This is one heavy piece, man. Okay, let's start taking apart this main shaft. First off, the 3 4 synchronized assembly, and again, take note of how the slider is. Thin side is facing forward. This will come right off, it'll slide right off. And leave it together unless you need to take it apart. Also, I don't know if you could see it. They usually have a little grind mark where they're matched. In other words, where the hub and slider are matched together from the factory. See that little grind mark over there? So if you do take them apart, always put it together the same way with the little marks matching one another. You can slide off the third gear. Now, this is an early box. It actually has a spacer here. Some later boxes actually had a snap ring. So there's going to be a spacer here and the three third gear needle bearing. Very simple. What they do is they put a ring around a split washer. And then they put a rotation, an anti-rotation ball around the ring. So you have the split ring. Kind of goes like this, all right? And then there's an anti-rotation ball for the ring. Then the second gear will come off. The second gear needle bearing comes off. It's a very easy box to take apart if you're not already can't see that. Second gear synchronizer ring. Now because this fifth speed gear is part of the main shaft, everything actually has to come off from the front. All right, so I turned around the main shaft so I can get at the snap ring for the one, two, and I'm using these kind of straight pliers, a little tough ring. It's very important that these rings be put on properly. There's an angle to them, and you want the narrow part of the angle facing forward. The one, two assembly will slide off. along with the first gear.
but it's a snapping for the first gear bearing. And they've got this snapping backwards, so it's a little bit problematic to get to because they put it through the wrong way. But it's coming out. I'm going to bag these two items separately. Now we have the same thing over here. We have a thrust washer with a spacer ring around it for the rear bearing. Okay. It's one of those split washers again. That split washer is going to have a rotation, an anti-rotation ball as well. So once I remove the split thrust washer and the anti-rotation ball, the bearing can slide out this way. Now there's no reason for me to take this bearing off, but basically they're a little tight sometimes. They slide a little bit, but sometimes they need a little work on the press to get them off. And you can put bearing clamps behind it and press it through the front down that way and take this bearing off. I actually don't really need to take this bearing off, so I'm going to leave it in place because, again, I'm just doing a case change for this customer, and this bearing looks fine. But I just wanted to show you what it takes to take this whole main shaft assembly apart. Now, looking over here, you can see the fifth speed gear is part of the main shaft on a, a Tremec 3550 TKO series type of transmission. So in order for you to change overdrive ratios, you actually physically have to change the main shaft to do that. There's no special gear that slides on this. So again, if you need to change your overdrive ratio, you need to change the whole main shaft with it. It gets very expensive. So I've got the first speed gear of this TKO transmission, and I just wanted to show you something. The, a lot of people complain about the synchronizer assemblies not shifting that well, these transmissions just being poor shifting in general. And the reason is, is that this particular style synchronizer ring is the same exact ring that was used in the Ford top loader in the 1960s. There's no real big technology change other than they've increased the mass of the gear train immensely. In fact, if you look at this counter gear, I mean, look at the mass of this gear, how big it is, okay? And I'll show you that in comparison to this counter gear, let's move this stuff away here. This is your TKO counter gear, and this is a four top loader counter gear. So one of the reasons why they shift horrible is because of the mass. You're using a 60 style synchronizer ring, and you've basically doubled the mass of the gear train. This is the TKO counter gear, this is the four top loader counter gear. The TKO counter gear has this extension on the back for the fifth assembly and a little bit smaller over here for a reverse and first. But over here, if you notice the girth of this assembly over here and the width of these gears, it's a big weight difference. And that is why they don't shift well. If they would have maybe made the synchronizer ring cones larger, you would have had a better shifting transmission. But that's what we have to work with. The other problem that you have is that these particular synchronizer rings Mean that the old Ford style uh, top loader ring don't seem to gear, grab the gears that well. Uh, I've noticed this problem. I put my fingers on here to protect them, okay? But I can apply a lot of pressure to this ring and it really doesn't grab the gear. This is a problem that I've seen on any Tremec product. The synchronizer rings that they use in their transmissions are junk. So I do have a better synchronizer ring for this. And that particular ring, let me just go grab it here. Is a similar forged bronze ring, but it actually, if I put my hands on here, it actually grabs better. Locks that ring, that ring locks to the gear quite well. Now, because these rings kind of skid on the gears, what I suggest that you do is that you take the gear, and if you look at the cone, you'll see it's kind of glazed and shiny. And dull it up a little bit with some 1500 grit sandpaper. So you take some 1500 grit sandpaper and just kind of put it around here like this and just scuff up the cone a bit, take the glaze off of it. Because these rings obviously have been skidding on the cone and not really grabbing properly. So I like to kind of just break the glaze like this. Clean up the cone a bit. And if you had a lathe, that would be better. But now we've got a nice little polished cone, it's better. And when we put that new ring on there, it's gonna lock instantly. That's what we wanna do. So you do that to all the gears, Put the better rings on them, clean up the cones, and you'll have a somewhat better shifting transmission. Now I'm doing a case change on this transmission, 
So I really don't know if the end play of the counter gear is going to be great with the new case. Now Tremec calls for zero of the 4000 Zen play of the counter gear. And what you should do in any of these transmissions is put the counter gear back in the case with just the bare essentials so you can actually feel it by hand to see what it's like. So what I did was I put the case and tail in place with just the counter gear inside, okay? And I put inside, I don't know if you can see in the back here, the fifth gear uh, roller sleeve and assembly is in there. So I've got this counter gear in here and you can actually spin it by hand and I can actually feel that it's got no end play. Not at all. It spins really nice. Usually actually in performance boxes I like to actually preload these a little bit because with new bearings they may seed in. So I may actually go 2000s preload. But this spins good. No end play. So what I want to do now is I want to duplicate this movement with the new case. Okay, so I got a brand new case for this job. Pretty nice. Here's the part number from Tremec. It's a Tremec 260 6106 transmission case assembly. Okay. What that means is the assembly comes with the dowel and with this cup and o ring already in it. But what I like to do is I like to put sealant in this hole and then press the cup and o-ring in place. I don't like just doing an o-ring seal. You never know. This case could stretch at use and then the o-ring seal could leak. So I like to put an additional anaerobic sealant in this hole and press it back in. Again, these normally are cups that are just put in with some grease in the bore and they slide the o-ring in which is a good idea because you don't want to cut up the o-ring but the ceiling kind of acts like a little bit of a lubricant and we want to put it on both surfaces hopefully we'll get this in nice and easy without any issues and tap it in place the trick is not to cock it and cut the o-ring up I do this on the T55 speeds as well but since this is going into a car that's extremely difficult to get the transmission out I don't want to have problems. This goes in nice and easy. I'm tapping it gently in the back. Not hard at all. See, so additional sealant is going to get squashed out, which is okay. I must say they really have the fits well designed. The T5 program, it's a lot trickier to get these things in, but fits in really nice. And the back side, all the sealant's gonna be trapped between the flange and the case. Once that cup is in place, we're gonna put in the front race for the counter gear bearing. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to check this out like I did on the last one and put the extension housing back in in the cluster just to see how the float feels. So I'm going to drop in the rear counter gear bearing. Make sure it's down all the way. And the thrust race. And just those necessary components to check the end play. Now what I'll do is I'll put the rear bearing race on the cone and these shims I'll put in the extension housing with some grease. So grease the back of the shims. That'll hold them in the tail. So I got the shims in place in the tail like this. I'm going to lay it all down on here. Plus it feels good, no end plate. Actually it's got a little bit more drag than the old one, which is what I like. Just by feel, it's probably not much. I would say it's probably like two inch pounds more drag, which is perfect. So this unit's gonna set up really good. That's what the old shims. Goes to show you that the cases are very accurate from case to case, amazing. Pretty good. You can use this anaerobic gel on the pivot It'll act as a thread locker and do a pretty good job of holding it in place. 
So pretty much you can screw this in by hand until the bottom's out. I've got the anaerobic gel on it, and because of the size of this bolt, and I'm going to torque it down to 45 foot-pounds. So the counter gear goes back in next. Push it forward. Now the best thing to do is flip this case around on its face. You can see that it spins nice and smooth. And then put in the rear bearing for the counter gear. Alright, so I pre-assembled the reverse eyelet and reverse gear assembly. Just want to show you how it goes together, okay? You got a thrust washer on either side of this. Alright? And you can see how it just works that when you're going reverse, this pushes forward and locks in. There are pointy teeth on this gear and they have to match the pointy splines on the slider. If you put it on backwards, it won't work. Now hopefully I'm going to pull this apart without taking out the, the bearings again. But you have here a short spacer on this side and the long needles inside this. Okay and a long spacer on this side. And then there's this thrust ring or another thrust washer that floats in between the two gears. So short spacer, long needles, long spacer, thrust bearing. That goes inside the short needles. There's two rows of them. Notice that this has got the pointy teeth on this edge. The other side doesn't. So, it just stays engaged with this. Thrust washer on the other side, which locates into the main case. Pull this apart. Hopefully they won't drop. Inside there, there's two rows of needles. So a spacer, row of needles, a spacer, row of needles. And then it goes against this large spacer down here. I kind of put this together like this to hold it all in place. And let's see how we drop this in the case now without dropping the needles out. Okay, Tremec thinks you're gonna try and do this thing with the case laying flat, but it's better when you have the weight of the gears working for you rather than against you. So I'm gonna put that thrust washer in for reverse over here. It catches in the case perfectly. And I'm going to drop this whole assembly down this way. It's a lot easier than doing it the way that they say it is, okay? So if you're looking at the manual, you may want to change it around a bit. Slide the other washer in place. And then drop the reverse idler shaft down into the whole assembly, carefully. Here we go. Because the counter gear can slide out of the case, just put some piece of wood or an old hammer handle or something like that underneath it to kind of tilt it forward so nothing keeps on trying to fall out of the back of the unit while you're working on it. I find that because the bearing fits are very loose, if you have it level, everything's going to want to keep on dropping back. So tilt the case forward whatever direction you're comfortable working with. Give it a little bit of an incline so the gear stays in place. Once the other assembly and cluster gear are in place, you could put that reverse arm back and its position. You can put it in there beforehand, but this gives you a little extra working room when you want to try to put in that idler gear. Okay. Now you're going to slide in the rail fur reverse. You got this notch over here that's got to face the pinhole in the rail like that so that you can put the drive pin in and hold it in place. Very critical. What I could do is I could mark it right over here so I know which side has to be up so this is orientated correctly inside the rail. I'm not going to see that while it's down there. So put a little bit of mark there. And then you're going to do is catch it in this, like this. Make sure it's kind of straight. And 
then drive the lock pin in. You can check how it works. Pretty simple. Right, so to get the input shaft assembled, you're gonna to have to put the 17 needle bearings back in the input. And I do that with some of the trans gel assembly lube I have. And you just kind of put them in like this. Usually the last one you have to slide in. No need to count them because you can only fit in as many as you can fit in. It's that simple. But use a lot of this stuff. I'm in Florida. <clears throat> and it's a little bit hot in the shop, so I tend to use assembly lube because it's not that temperature dependent as, say, wheel bearing grease. So a lot of the wheel bearing grease that you can use, I mean, you could use it, but what may happen is it may start to melt, especially if your shop gets hot, but uh, tends not to get too hot. In most people's shops, but in Florida, you have a hot day, it can uh, melt the grease. So as you can see, it's falling down. You have to really pack that stuff in there. Get it all in. Once it's all in, pretty much, it's not going to fall down anymore. So the last one, you really can't just push it. you got to kind of slide it in like this. You see, you got to push it in lengthwise like that. Before I assemble the main shaft in the transmission, I want to point out a few things. These thrust washers are two different sizes. The larger diameter one fits inside the synchronizer cone for the input shaft. The smaller diameter one, which I'm going to grease up, fits on the 3-4 synchro hub. The bearing gets sandwiched between both of them like this. So when they're in, it's going to spin on that bearing like that. Then you can put this whole assembly now in the case. So now that I got that fourth gear synchronizer cone on the end of the main shaft with the thrust washer, I could put the whole gear train in the case. I'm going to try to go into the camera so you can see what I'm doing. Okay. Then you want to put the rear bearing race in place. Notice I've still got everything kind of jacked up a little bit on the back side to keep everything pointing down, which is why the, the fourth gear cone and, and single are kind of falling out. Make sure your needles are all pressed down flat. Okay, so I got the gear train in, fourth gear synchronizer cone, thrust wash is there. You can see that it's working really good. Now I'm going to slide in that input shaft. Hopefully I can get these needle bearings to stay in place properly and get a direct clean shot in. Here we go. Probably the hardest part of this whole transmission is loading the needle bearings in the fifth speed gear. Alright, so what I've done is I've held in place a whole row of needle bearings with some grease. And uh, there's a space that goes in the back over here. It's going to go in over here like this in the inside. And you can see the needles. Nice and neat. And now I'm going to do the back side. Put another row there in the inside. Takes a lot more assembly lube to put it in. Because you got to make the needle stick. It's a hot day today. As I mentioned before, uh, sometimes uh, you can use regular wheel bearing grease. I use this assembly lube because it tends to maintain its tack better through a wide range of temperature differences, especially in your shop. Like me, I'm in a high climate. If I were to use like a heavy duty wheel bearing grease, it probably would start melting. This stuff uh, maintains its tack better. And even then it's still a little tricky. So the object here is that we're going to put all these needles in and slide the whole sleeve for fifth gear through here with the synchronizer ring. We're going to mount the thrust washer on the counter shaft and we're going to put the fork on this whole assembly and try to catch everything on one piece onto the fifth reverse rail. That's the idea. 
hopefully we can get everything in here without the needles falling out and making a mess. Okay, so I got all my needles in here now. The spacer's in the middle. Looks good. Just making sure they're all pressed into place. I put some grease on the fifth speed ring just to hold it on the cone. And then try to gently catch everything without making a mess. Now this thrust washer is going to go on the counter shaft. Notice that it has a step in it. The short side faces the bearing and the wide side faces the gear. And you can see where it actually retains the needles. Very important. So you got to put some grease here for the anti-rotation ball. Put it in place with my finger. Slide that thrust washer in, short side facing the bearing. Make sure it catches that ball. Now I'm going to carefully start the sleeve on the counter shaft and at the same time catch the rail. I try to walk everything in and I'm actually looking in the back over here to see that the needles don't come out at all. Okay. I'll put a little punch there just to line up the rail. Everything looks sweet. Looks really good. At this point, you might as well put the rear bearing cone on the counter gear on the end of it. Just slides right on like that. And we're going to put the dowel pin now on the shift fork over here. Put some grease to hold the anti-rotation ball in place for the speedometer gear. Slide the speedometer gear on with the slot facing forward so it catches the ball. There we go. Let's take a quick look at the top cover of this transmission. I'm not going to take apart this top cover. I will probably do another video in disassembling and reassembling the TKO 500, 600, or the Tremac 3550 top covers. It's a pretty simple cover to take apart, but honestly, it's not worth taking apart and doing it because there's nothing wrong with it. Usually these covers never really have a problem. Sometimes shift forks do break and you have to change the fork, which is a question of just popping out the rail and changing the shift fork. But let me show you a few things about the cover anyway. So you have three rails in the cover. One, two rail, three, four rail, fifth and reverse rail. Each fork is fastened with a simple roll pin. Here's the roll pin for the one, two fork. The roll pin for the three, four fork is buried right over here. And the roll pin for the fifth reverse fork is over here. This little gadget over here with the two bolts holds the springs and balls for the detents and the interlocks slide through the, the cover through a hole over here. So when you pull the rails out, you put each interlock in there. I believe that there's a long, a short interlock over here and two long interlocks at the end. Simple barrel interlocks that work. This piece over here, there's steel bushings in here that support the rails and there's o-ring seals in these bushings. So in the event that you need to change, let's say the 3-4 fork which is aluminum, you simply take this detent plate off, pop that roll pin out, slide the rail out, put the new fork in place, slide the rail back in, put the detent cover back on. It's pretty straightforward. This is typical of any truck type transmission. This is not a really good shifting design because you have a three rail system with interlocks that could hang up. So sometimes when you're blueprinting these covers, maybe you polish the rails, maybe you make sure that the interlocks don't hang up. You may have to trim them a little bit so that they shift well. But pretty much that's it. If the, if the interlocks are working correctly and the detents haven't chewed up the rails, you're usually good to go. So I wire wheeled all the bolts and cleaned up all the threads, cleaned the covers up, put a new seal on the front bearing retainer, Let's put the transmission together already. Okay, I'm gonna use the Dynatex anaerobic gasket maker. 
It's the same stuff that Tremec used when they first assembled this transmission. And I see a little bit of the sealant goes into the threads, so it kind of automatically acts like a thread locker. As you put the cover down, it's going to squash a little bit into the holes. So I never get that there's a reason to use thread locker on it, but you can put a little bit of the sealant on the bolts. And what's great about taking off the top cover of the main cover is you can actually see what's going on. And drop it down and see if I'm actually catching everything perfectly. So as this cover went straight down, some of the sealant already encapsulated the holes a little bit. So again, there's no reason to put thread locker on these bolts. This is plenty. The torque spec for these bolts, according to Tremex books, are 18 to 22 foot-pounds. I kind of think 18 is where I'd rather be. Because now that I got it all down, basically I'm just going to go torque these bolts down to 18 foot-pounds. all around here. If you watch my videos in the past, I don't like leaving any excess sealant squeezed out so this is an anaerobic sealant so it actually stays wet on the outside and dries with the absence of air that's what an anaerobic sealant does so it'll always be messy on the outside and that's not cool because you don't want the person who is handling the transmission to get this stuff all over their clothes clean everything up so it looks somewhat presentable and it's the right thing to do i'm gonna put a little grease where the o-rings go and they take double o-rings over here I've never seen any system take double O-rings before. You would have think lip seals would be a better choice, but these fit nice and tight. They're not stretched out. So I'm putting new O-rings in over here. Um, I think I need smaller fingers. What do you think, guys? Let's grease this up thoroughly. Make sure the O-rings don't overlap one another, that you actually have a true double O-ring seal. Now that this is done, I'm going to put the extension housing on. I've already put a new seal in the extension housing. I don't think I need to show you how to do that. Uh, I have other videos that show you how to clean parts and uh, put seals and things, and I don't think that's really necessary. Watch some of my other videos. I'm pushing in the O-rings to make sure they don't pop out, but it's almost next to impossible to get these extension housings together without the O-rings kind of wanting to climb out of the, where they're supposed to be. So Tremex says to torque these extension housing bolts down to 42 to 52 foot-pounds. I'm going to set it at 45.
I'm just gradually bringing these bolts down a little bit. All right, so I got the extension housing on, all sealed up really nicely. And you can see I've got all three shift rails exposed and the main rail floating around over here. In order to make it easier for me to put the three fingers in place, I'm gonna take a piece of paper towel, stuff it in here, so that I can kind of keep the rail somewhat centralized in this position like this, okay? So I'm gonna put the middle three fourth finger in first, then the one, two, and then the fifth in reverse. So what I'll do is I'll push this one in. Get it there. Remember I had them marked. This is the one, two. That one's in place. Now I'm going to do the fifth in reverse. There you go. Now I'm going to just put the three dowel pins back in. So while I got these covers off, I just want to show you how this thing works. You have your bias springs inside these arms. So when you move the lever one way or the other way, that's what gives you your neutral feel. Each one of these will push the center rail back into the neutral position. This little gadget over here is your reverse lockout. Basically, when you go into reverse and you go this way and engage reverse, which I'm going to do for you, you'll see that this plunger arm is against this little tab here. Okay, but if I go into fifth, which is here, and back down, back down, you'll see that the arm returns. Now, in order for this to come forward, it's a safety mechanism because it's gonna hit block out against this arm, so you can't go from fifth directly into reverse. You'll have to go here, you'll see, and it brings it back up into the neutral position. So this little tab here is very really important. It's a safety feature so you can't go from fifth and accidentally go back into reverse. That's simply how the mechanism works for the shifter. This is typical, again, of a truck shifter arrangement. It works fairly well, but it's kind of bulky because when you're trying to power shift with a single rail like this going between all these gates, sometimes they're going to hang. They're not going to move as fast and react as they should. That's why, again, they don't shift as well as a single rail system like in a T5 or a T56. Because the cluster gear is set up very nicely, I'm pretty confident that the input shaft is going to shim perfect as well. So I'm going to just drop in the old shims and the bearing race. These bearings are well, like brand new, by the way. And <clears throat> tap this in. Just put it in with a couple of bolts just to see how it fits, okay? It feels really good so far. And any of these types of transmissions that have tapered bearings, just give them a little whack in the front and the back with a rubber mallet to make sure that the races are seated. You can actually put your palms on both the input and the output shaft and feel if it's got any end play. The spec calls for zero of the 4000s end play on the input. We've got nothing over here. Then what I'll usually do is put a yoke inside the back. I have a spare yoke like this. I'll put it in the back of the transmission. 
spin it and hold the input and see that it's not binding. And actually this transmission feels perfect. I can put the yoke in, they can spin independent of one another. Perfect alignment. Put my new yoke back here. Now I'll take this off, and then what I'll do is I'll put sealant on it and torque it down. Because I put the input shaft bearing retainer back in place now with sealant. I just want to go check it out. This is supposed to be torqued down to 15 foot-pounds. That's what they say. Feels great. Feels great. So I got this whole transmission all together, other than just putting the shifter back in place and all the remote shifter covers over here. Reverse switch, neutral safety switch, and the fill and drain plugs on the other side. It's pretty much all together, but we still haven't found the reason why that case cracked to begin with. But let me show you what happened. This transmission was used with an adapter plate that had these countersunk bolts in it. So what I noticed is that the bolts that are supposed to be countersunk are not. And they were just sticking out enough so that when the case was bolted flat against this, these bolts actually caused the ear to bend over them and crack. That was a problem. You know, it's the little things that matter. Something like that, just overlooking that little bit of clearance, can cost you a lot of money. So I just want to show you one thing again. This is the old style 3555 speed shifter. The newer style TKO 500 600 shifter. It's a much more beautiful piece. It's all billet, more streamlined. Only thing I don't like about it, it's got no stops. The older shifters had stops in it. So there's a lot of aftermarket shifters now that duplicate this. But you can see that the bolt pattern on this shifter is symmetrical, where this shifter it is not. So this shifter on the newer style units allows you to kind of flip it around 180 degrees and get an extra shift location over here. That's the only difference. Okay, the 3555 speed, which again is very similar to the TKO 500 and 600 series. What I did on this transmission again was I repaired the case. It had a broken case. So here it is all together with the brand new case. I put both covers back in place, the shifter, the reverse switch, the neutral safety switch, and the adaptive speedometer fitting. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. You see that? You see what I'm talking about? Got it.